my name is uh, Mark Wager. I'm a professor at the University of Amsterdam, Department of Media Studies. And um, I wanted to talk today um, a little bit about how media studies um, as a field, as a discipline, can contribute to the discussion, to the experience that we are all having in this global pandemic. Um, I mean, of course, the, 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 the real scientists uh, and scholars that can contribute to this pandemic are the people who are into medicine and uh, helping to combat uh, this virus and, and its infection rate. However, I do feel that those of us who study media and communication have a voice in all of this and that the role of media and communication is incredibly powerful in both how it, people experience the pandemic as well as how we can do something about it uh, in different ways. And that's what I wanted to, to talk uh, with, with you about uh, today. Um, I'm doing this from a very particular perspective. Um, I've been working for the last couple of years on a book, uh, this one. Um, it's a, a handbook of media mass communication theory originally written by the great and late British sociologist Dennis McQuill in 1969. Uh, we're currently in its, in its uh, seventh edition. And this book arguably has been at the basis of the emergence of media studies and communication science as two disciplines uh, that concern themselves with the study of media and communication. Um, so what I'll talk about today is taken from the work on this handbook, which in turn was a book that helped actually form and found departments and units uh, at universities and schools all over the world. So I'm incredibly privileged that I could work on this new edition uh, after the passing, of course, of the great Dennis McQuill, uh, uh, with whom I was very privileged to, to work uh, uh, with on this book right until his passing. Um, so what did Dennis leave us as tools to talk about uh, the current uh, corona or COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Well, there are many different ways of, of, of thinking about this. Um, but most fundamentally, he gave us seven basic theories that each of them explain and help us understand the relationship that media have with society. And these seven theories have grown out of over a hundred years of scholarship. So in other words, this is a century worth of, of knowledge and of insight and of theories that still inform the way we make sense of the role media play today. And what is so exceptionally powerful about these theories is that they, they, they make us a bit more modest in making claims about well, how Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any of the new contemporary media change everything. Well, no, they don't. Uh, they actually fit in a long pattern, a long way of making sense of media and how it affects our lives and how it makes our societies work or perhaps not work. So I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit how each of these theories uh, has postulated and how they are applicable to what's happening at the moment uh, in the world and, and how they help us make sense of things. One of the very first theories was what Dennis calls the mass society theory. It's a theory that coincided with the rise of big urban centers and modern societies in the late 19th and early 20th century when people by the hundreds of thousands started moving into big sprawling urban centers, working in factories, driving in the first cars, uh, a completely new way of life. And, and, and theories that explain how the mass society grew up and how people were kind of lost in these masses. Uh, the, the, the role of media was seen as incredibly powerful, as a determinant of how people made sense of this new massive world that they were living in. And the public was seen as atomized individuals that pretty much directly took from the media a certain truth about the world they live in. 
And this theory is still at work today. Think about, for example, of how incredibly concerned so many people are about so-called fake news and misinformation and lies and rumors that spread via primarily social media, but also regular media into people's homes. The notion that somehow if we are exposed to uh, misinformation campaigns about this camp about this pandemic, for example, that a certain medicine is supposed to work or that it has to do that the coronavirus has anything to do with 5G or those kind of stories, those kind of hoaxes, those kind of lies. Uh, that when we get that in our social media feeds and we see that on our televisions, that somehow that becomes our way of making sense of things. Now, our research on the one hand shows that that's not the case. I mean, less than 10% of people on average actually are exposed to this kind of hoaxes and lies. And the vast majority of people who do see these kind of messages don't believe them. Um, so that would discredit that kind of concern. On the other hand, we may not be a mass society of atomized individuals anymore because we're all connected in media, but are we connected in that we, are we actually listening to each other online? Or is everybody basically sending rather than receiving? And if everybody's sending, nobody's listening. And that in turn does make us a mass society of atomized individuals. So let's not discredit this old theory just yet. A second powerful theory that Dennis talks about in his book and that we've updated for the new edition is um, the political economy way of looking at the world, which is, of course, largely based on um, the work of economists and sociologists and political theorists from the late 19th and early 20th century, foremost among them, Mr. Karl Marx, of course, um, which, which gives primacy to an economic uh, superstructure, an economic uh, explanation of how things work. Uh, in a nutshell, you could say, uh, if you want to understand society, you got to follow the money, right? Who, 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 who owns what, who has access to what, who controls what, that has to do with who is the richest, who is the most powerful. And the role of media in all of this is that as media, as institutions get richer and, 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 and become more prominent in society, they become increasingly uh, interested in maintaining the status quo in, 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 in strengthening their position in, in rather than challenging anything or critiquing anything. Um, and, and so a political economy reading of contemporary society and the role of media, media in it is, is, is very powerful and, and, and very important. And, and it is at work in, in a lot of debates that are happening right now around the global pandemic, particularly when you listen to people who are very worried or critical about the way, for example, journalists cover the coronavirus crisis. They accuse journalists of being, you know, too much focus on consensus, of towing the government line, of admonishing people to stay at home and to follow the rules and to keep social distance and to uh, constantly uh, embrace a sort of a nationalistic or even patriotic message, right? It's hard to find news about anywhere else in the world right now. Everything seems to be about our local little place and we're all have to be the same. And this is, this is very much part of a political economy critique if you will, of journalism. And a second role that political economy plays right now is in the fact that we see so few stories about the enormous consequences that all of this lockdown and social distancing is having on the least fortunate in our societies. The people without perhaps access to digital technologies, without the necessary skills of using them. People who cannot afford to stay at home. And losing a day or a week's wages is losing food on the table for your family, for your children. And, and stories like that, although they do exist, of course, in the news, are rare in these circumstances. 
and, and, and a, a critique could be inspired by political economy. Well, that's because media are so closely aligned right now with powerful and vested interests in uh, society. A third fundamental uh, media society theory is the theory of functionalism. The notion that society is an organic being uh, where all major functions are divided. Uh, for health, we go to the hospital. For news, we go to journalism. For governance, we go to the government. We don't do all of that ourselves. We've sort of outsourced major functions in society to major institutions. And, and a functionalist appreciation of what's happening right now um, can be found in the debates about digital health and telemedicine had the incredibly fast development of all kinds of technological applications that supposedly are making us better and um, the fact that we're all now having to install apps on our smartphones that do contact tracing and track the virus across society um, uh, automated bots that screen and refer patients, uh, telehealth visits by doctors so you don't have to go to the hospital anymore. There's even um, um, automated ICU intensive care units that monitor the intensive cares uh, in multiple hospitals to see which patients uh, need uh, our support and, and need uh, direct help. The underlying assumption in all of this is very much a functionalist one namely that media and communication technologies can serve the function of keeping people healthy and helping patients to recover and, by, and thereby relieving or even replacing staff. Another way of looking at all of this is through the lens of social, um, there it is, <laughs> social um, constructionism, right? A, a powerful theory originally coined in the 1960s recently updated by two media scholars, uh, Nick Coldry and Andreas Hap, if they're watching, shout out to my friends, Nick and Andreas, uh, who, who updated uh, uh, their book on the social construction of reality in media. Um, um, and, and the notion here is perhaps a bit more liberating. It's not a mass society that we're living in as atomized individuals where we're powerless to, to do anything about our reality. A social constructivist reading of this would be is that, well, in every thing we do, in every little act, in every way we communicate, we make the world that we live in. So it looks at how the world is constantly changing and how our actions are part of, 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 of making this change. It, it assumes that reality is not sort of a stable given, the same for everybody, but that we each create in some way our own reality. And, um, and of course, when we consider the role of media from such a perspective, what we're getting is a notion that through using media, by watching TV, by reading magazines, by playing games, by posting on social media, we do not just consume reality, but also produce a kind of reality as individuals, but also because we're all connected together. And the social constructivist reading of the pandemic can be found in, for example, all the communications from the World Health Organization, because early on in February, they came out with statements saying that, yes, there's a global pandemic and, a, 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 and, it's, and it's, it has a massive impact on the world, that, that's this coronavirus, However, there is an equally dangerous, these are the words of the WHO, equally dangerous epidemic going on, and they called it an infodemic, which means the spread of false information, lies, rumors, fake news, misinformation about this virus that can be as dangerous as actually getting the, getting the virus or being infected. These are strong statements. I mean, WHO has an infodemic team, a fabulous team actually uh, uh, debunking all the false information and myths about this virus. But the idea that somehow consuming and sharing news that might not be entirely true creates a reality which is just as dangerous as the actual reality of this virus 
is a very bold statement informed by this 1960s theory, uh, if you will. The next uh, theory that I would like to briefly discuss is one of technology, technology determinism. This is another way of saying that there's a long tradition in media studies and communication science of looking at phases in technological developments as mirroring phases in social or societal developments. Um, in the other words, a new technological tool, a new device, a new platform also changes the kind of society we live in. And right now, there's a lot of literature on our society as being a platform society because so much of our society now runs on platforms from Zoom, the, the platform that we're using right now, to Airbnb for our homes, to Tinder for our love lives, and Facebook and Instagram, and all those other social media for our social lives. Um, technology determinism is visible in the current pandemic. If we look at the endless amount of reports, studies, uh, news stories already, coming out about the role and influence of social media in the global pandemic, and specifically in the relationship between virology and virality. And this is fascinating. Um, so there's been a study already done in China by uh, a group of Chinese colleagues that looked at what people were searching on using search engines like Sina Weibo, Baidu, and, uh, Baidu and, and Google and the uh, reported instances of people getting infected in January and February of 2020, earlier this year. And what they found is that people searching for symptoms and information about the virus preceded the actual spread of infections by one to two weeks. In other words, Google could have predicted the virus because two weeks before Cases started to be reported by hospitals. People were looking on, online about information about constant coughing, pneumonia, uh, difficulty breathing, and so on and so forth. Um, so here you see how uh, um, um, a particular kind of technology actually can serve to predict and, 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 and influence, therefore, the spread of something happening in the real or non-media world. Uh, so, uh, now, technology determinism is often written off as a, as a, as a too uh, bold way of, of making sense of technologies. Technologies don't have that direct effect on us. But this coincidence of virality and virology serves to remind us that maybe it's too fast to write off. Determinism might actually be useful, might actually help. Um, the, the sixth major theory that we discuss in our book, in this, uh, in this ridiculously <laughs> thick book, is the theory of the information society. And, and today we would call this the network society, right? The, the notion that somehow there is, a, um, a, 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 that our world has changed significantly uh, from uh, originally perhaps an agricultural society then to sort of an industrial economy uh, and a service economy to today an information economy where the primary form of capital is access to and the use of information. Uh, it's not a coincidence that the most highly valued companies in the world today are companies that deal in information. Companies like Facebook, for example, or like Tencent. Um, so the information society key premise or the network society as it's called today, key premise is a premise of, and that's what I wanted to show with this image, interconnectedness. Had a notion that, 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 that information doesn't respect borders. Um, we love to think that we still live in countries like Slovakia or the Netherlands or the United States, but our information economy doesn't care, right? Uh, our internet of things, uh, the internet in itself, information flows flow uh, almost unfettered uh, across borders. And I think that's uh, uh, um, a really um, uh, interesting theory to make sense of this. Actually, my previous comments about the coincidence of virality and virology 
belong more to the network society than to technology determinism, come to think of it. I have to correct myself there. Um, if you think of it, a determinist reading would suggest that um, all this virality of people sharing information about this virus online and being all interconnected makes uh, either people bring out the best in themselves or the worst in themselves, right? Uh, that that we, us sharing information on social media uh, um, is fabulous because it, it gives us a feeling of being in it together, social support, and all, and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Or the exact opposite, that this brings out the worst because what are people sharing online? Lots of hatred, fear, racism, xenophobia. Now that's a very deterministic reading of the role of social media. A more nuanced network, society-informed reading of social media would say how uh, uh, all the sharing of information uh, in fact precedes the, the, the sharing of the virus. And how, in other words, what's happening in the non-media world, the world of the virus in this case, in our context, um, coincides with, cannot see, be seen separately from what's happening in the world of media and networks. So a little um, speaker error there, but I'm sure you'll fix it. Um, a final theory that I wanted to briefly discuss uh, in the final couple of minutes of, of my talk uh, today is uh, a, the only theory, if you will, of all the major media and society theories that have been postulated in the field of media studies and communication science that is particular to media scholars. And we shouldn't forget that people studying media and communication as a discipline haven't been around for, for that long. Uh, most of the departments in media and communication didn't exist before the late 1980s. Uh, up until that time, the people who studied media and communication were psychologists and, and sociologists and, and anthropologists, economists, geographers. And now we're media scholars. And it took us a while, but we're beginning to formulate our own theories about uh, how media and society interact. And one of the more interesting and powerful theories of the recent years is called, uh, there it is, mediatization. And mediatization is a very simple, it's perhaps more of a concept, a sensitizing concept than a theory, if you will. It simply suggests like, look, media have become incredibly powerful as a force in society, both in terms of the devices and the things we do with them every day, but also as institutions that have a prominent role in our societies. This can be combined with an equally valid observation that if you want to function well in society, you have to do it via media, right? If you want to be a bullet, a great example is the American elections, right? I mean, we've, we are hearing stories of presidential candidates like Major Bloomberg, who's spending tens of millions of dollars on advertising campaigns and still doesn't get elected. And so we're laughing, ha ha, he wasted his money. Actually, he didn't. The thing is, if you don't spend all that money on election campaigns in media, you're not being taken seriously as a politician. That is mediatization, right? We can explain it by mediatization, that we cannot function effectively outside of media. This even goes for us as individuals. I have plenty of students who would tell me, if I'm not on Facebook or Instagram, I don't exist. So that's mediatization. How does mediatization apply to what's happening right now? Well, it applies to the expectations we all have of how governments and journalists, for example, deal with the virus. Because what we are commenting on is not so much whether people get better, but primarily how we are informed. So apparently, the stories that we are told about the virus are just as uh, perhaps even more important than the virus actually being dealt with by, for example, developing a vaccine. We all assume that we can't really do anything about that. So our energy focuses on the media. How does a politician communicate? How are the conf press conferences of leaders like Donald Trump or anybody else for that matter, how are they effective or perhaps not? 
are journalists succeeding in telling us the truth, in being dispassionate, in, 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 in giving us the real deal? And at the same time, we perhaps ignore the fact that journalists are caught up in the epidemic as well, are underpaid, are not trusted by us, uh, we're no, we, we don't pay for their products, and against all odds, still deliver the news every day. And I think they deserve an enormous amount of respect from all of us. Doesn't mean they don't deserve our criticism. It just means they're human beings too, doing everything they can to make us, to pull us through, just as doctors and nurses are doing. So in conclusion of this, this short introduction to what I hope is one way of articulating the relevance of media studies and communication science, the study of media and communication to living through a global pandemic as all of us are. Um, I wanna point out two trends that I don't have an explanation for, but I think really deserve all our attention as students and researchers and perhaps just interested observers of media and communication, which is a twin development. On the one hand, what is happening today is a coincidence or convergence, if you will, of two media systems collapsing. The first media system is the system that our parents and grandparents all know. It's, a, it's the media system of television stations and newspapers and radio stations giving us information, broadcasting, putting things in print, telling us stories made up by professionals doing the hard work of, 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 of making the stories look good, be professional and all of that. And that's lovely and that's, that's, that's fabulous. Um, the second media system that we're experiencing is this crazy chaotic world of social and mobile media where endless amounts of information and opinions and, 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 and stories and, and, and memes and, and funny videos and, and, and cool games and all of that tumble around on our phones like we're click and swap and swipe and, and everything is happening at the same time. These two media systems have completely collapsed. Smarter people than I call this a hybrid media system. And we still haven't figured out how information actually flows across this system. What we do know is that information has no more hierarchy, right? That for people like you and me, there isn't a real hierarchy between a status update of a friend, the headline in the New York Times, the trailer of a new movie, and the boss fight of your favorite game. They're all there at the same time on your screen and your screen in your hand or in front of your face or on the wall. So a hybrid, we're living through the reality of a hybrid media system. It's not a media theory anymore, it's media practice. And the second major development is that all of this is happening and converging as well in our homes. Because here we are all in lockdown, self-isolation, quarantine and social distancing. And we're stuck in our homes, big homes, tiny little homes, homes packed with people, homes where you're all alone. And we're sitting here with our devices trying to make sense of this craziness that's happening, this terrible, terrible event affecting so many people, killing our friends and family members. Um, and, and, and not just that, but all the other aspects of our lives are coming at us here at home as well. We're not just at home where we're private, we're also very much in public because we're working from home and we're having drinks on Zoom in the evening at home and we play games on, on apps on our phone at home. Our cultural life and we watch beautiful opera or people singing from their balconies at home. Everything is happening at home now. In other words, there's a convergence of media systems and a convergence of all aspects of life, economic life, cultural life, social life, all at home. So these, this dual convergence, if you will, is profound. I don't have much more to say about that. I just want to articulate that that is a profound source of research for the future, of reflection, of autoethnography, of documenting how this makes you feel and what you do, 
And all of that is incredibly meaningful. And I would encourage everybody to embrace that way of looking at yourself in this particular moment of our shared history. Because if there's anything we need at the moment is shared history. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And uh, I hope to see you soon in the real world.